There we go. And I will share my screen. OK, can everyone see that? Is that a yes? Good. Chetna, thank you very much. I got a nod of the head. Brilliant. Right. So uh, life on the verge in Devon. What does it mean? What is it? Uh, what are we doing as Devon County Council? Uh, so as I said, uh, currently there is uh, four ecologists working for Devon County Council and we work with our highways uh, team um, in order to try and discuss with them uh, managing verges for wildlife um, and I'm sure everyone here um, is fully aware of the value of, of wildlife friendly verges uh, in terms of what they provide for pollinators, nesting birds, uh, foraging mammals, that sort of stuff. So um, basically what we do is we, we try and work within our current DCC policies to promote as best we can <laughs> within, uh, within DCC uh, wildlife friendly verges. Uh, now that is uh, when I'll go on to talk about why uh, harder than uh, I would like it to be but um, we are currently trying to have those discussions. So uh, current Devon County Council grass cutting policy uh, is to cut road verges for health and safety reasons. Now essentially what that means is that Devon County Council will cut uh, all road verges which are visibility displays and um, all, road, all sort of forward uh, approaches to signs uh, and, and that's it. So that's where Devon County Council's remit sort of ends. Um, in 2013, the council went through what was known as tough choices, which was basically where the uh, budget for our highways team was reduced. Um, and that meant that forced the current policy switch, uh, whereas we used to cut more regularly, uh, we now only cut very, very minimal verges and they are based purely on health and safety reasons. So, um, so essentially what that equates to is, is those, those two uh, bullet points below, a rural cutting regime and an urban cutting regime. Um, now a rural cutting regime is, uh, Devon County will cut all visibility displays uh, once a year on the rural road network, which is 60 miles an hour or over. Uh, and uh, they are cut between mid-May and mid-June. Now, obviously, uh, the picture on the right there shows a rural road verge, normally along a, a fairly high-speed road, and instantly the, the cutting mid-May to mid-June um, puts us in conflict with ecology quite a lot of the time. Um, a lot of the time, flowers that's when wildflowers are in flower, um, but that is also when grass grows the, the longest. So that is why that one cut is undertaken uh, that time of year. If it's a particularly intense growing year, um, they may put another cut in towards July and August. Uh, but for the rural roads, anything 60 mile an hour or over, uh, it's it's one cut, and it, again, only on visibility displays. Uh, and what Devon County will do is they'll start on the higher priority road network, so they'll start on the A roads, uh, and they'll work their way through the county, finishing on the C roads, uh, towards the end of June. So that's the idea. Um, and as I said, it used to be far more extensive cutting than what they do currently, but it is just, just the one cut now and just on inside of bends, junctions, laybys, and forward approaches to signage for health and safety reasons. Um, we also have an urban cutting regime in which uh, that relates to roads 40 miles an hour or under. So uh, a lot of rural, still sort of rural really uh the villages and towns throughout devon um but what they'll do is same thing so they'll only cut visibility displays so sides of junctions signage uh, laybys that sort of stuff uh but they'll cut them four times a year uh again throughout uh april through till august uh, and they'll space out their four cuts uh accordingly uh again if it's a particularly intense growing year um they might add a fifth cut but essentially uh urban areas urban cutting uh the grass is cut more regularly um uh again just visibility can't stress that enough uh some parish town councils and other organizations have taken control of their urban cutting regime so uh for example 
the village I live in, so Wesley in Mid Devon. Um, we Devon County Council don't do any cutting there. That's all done by um, Mid Devon District, and they have a completely different cutting regime. So they cut far more frequently. They cut once a month throughout spring and summer. Um, and uh, what they'll do is they receive funding from Devon County. So Devon will will sort of uh, estimate well they won't estimate they'll um calculate how much money they spend on cutting the visibility displays in that in their particular area whether it's a parish or a town or a district uh, and they will pay that council that set fee and then any additional cutting that is done so um for example as i said in my local village uh, all the cut additional cutting on top of the four that dcc would have done is is, ta is paid for at the expense of wh whoever is is taken on that responsibility so what that essentially means is that if it's a, a verge that isn't a visibility area um, and it has been cut, then it is unlikely to have been Devon County Council that has cut it. Uh, it is likely to have been a parish, a district or a town council that has <laughs> taken on that responsibility. Um, and uh, yeah, as I said, again, a lot of the time that does lead us into direct conflict with regards to ecology because of the time of year that it's been cut. Uh, but there's also some opportunities, um, especially with the, the, the bottom power, uh, bullet point there, in that where parish and town councils have taken on some responsibility, um, they can also decide to cut other verges uh, for the benefit of wildlife. So if, for example, they are willing to take addition, undertake additional cutting uh, on, on the road verges which aren't visibility displays, um, then there is an opportunity there for those parish and town councils to pay a contractor to cut verges bespoke to, to manage it for wildlife and, 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 and that sort of stuff. Um, but as I said, a lot of the time when that option is taken up, that's because the parish or town council feels that not enough cutting is being done. So uh, what usually ends up happening is the verges tend to be cut more frequently than four times a year, which is a shame. But there is opportunities there for some to uh, to, to cut in accordance with um, biodiversity uh, you know, efforts. Uh, what I would say is if a town or parish council does take it on, they have to undertake a legal agreement with Devon County. So there's no option to reduce the amount of cutting on the visibility areas. They have to be cut a minimum of four times a year. If so if you do enter into a legal agreement, you need to still cut the same areas that Devon County will cut because it's a health and safety risk. Uh, you can't, for example, uh, if, if Devon cut your verges at the moment and you take on that responsibility, you can't reduce the amount of cutting on that visibility display because you will then be liable for any accidents or, or health and safety risk. So it is, that's why really it's mainly because they feel that there's not, that there's too little cutting, but there could be some opportunities there for other areas of grass and verge to be cut for biodiversity. Um, and the, the reason we do it is, it is you know, um, as you can, you might be able to tell from Devon County's current policy is Devon County in terms of the verges it's, it, it is responsible for is sort of in a, in a different position to other local planning authorities. So for other local planning authorities, they currently spend quite a lot of money on fairly frequent cutting of verges. And you get obviously um, over cutting where flowers can't set seed, uh, they are cut. Uh, far too frequently and the, the sward is really short like a like a snooker table uh, so a lot of LPAs Dorset for a long time cut all of their verges uh, four times a year so they were in a position where they could actually reduce the amount of cutting they do to save money but also for biodiversity benefits and that had a massive implication on on their road verges uh, and their ability to to allow wildflowers to grow on their verges because they just reduced their cutting down from four cuts to, to two cuts throughout the year, uh, which again was which a double whammy of saving money and also improving biodiversity. DCC are in a different position in that the areas that are outside of visibility displays, such as this road here, so these two verges on this straight road, um, don't get cut at all, and they haven't been cut since 2013. Uh, so a lot of our verges now in Devon um, have not had regular grass and management. Um, 
and uh, that's meant that they have become overcompeted and tall rank grassland so you can see a lot of uh, Yorkshire fog in the image on the right there uh, and sort of bigger bullies really like hogweed as, and as shown on the image on the left have completely taken over road verges and meant that our wildflowers have been basically shaded out and out competed uh, so we in Devon County are in a position where actually we're, we're trying to persuade our highways authority to spend more money on grass and cutting and uh, that is proving to be a lot harder than getting them to not spend more money to get them to spend less money but that's the sort of situation we're in um i'll just touch on sort of grassland management at this point i've you know i've made the assumption that that people know uh the best way to manage a grassland but for for road verges the the, the best way to manage ro a road verges is similar to any other lowland meadow basically so um a lot of road verges especially rural verges uh as shown on the left are, are usually um sort of remnants of very old grasslands because they've been cut off with the by the road network and they're no longer farmed so the seed bank in in our road verges is usually pretty good um, and throughout devon we have a number of really um quite uh, established seed banks uh, but as i said the problem they have is they're being outcompeted. so as with any grassland the best way to manage a road verge is to, is to cut it twice a year once in the end of february and once again at the end of August, start of September, uh, and uh, make sure all of the arisings from the cuts are raked away, basically. Um, if you cut grass and leave the arisings on top of the grass, uh, it will um, the, basically decompose and add nutrients into the soil. Uh, and while flowers, lowland meadows um, really need sort of low nutrient soils in order to survive. So um, if you add nutrients back into the soil by not raking away the, the grassland, um, then uh, essentially you still end up, even if you do manage it by cutting, you still end up with this sort of habitat because uh, the high nutrient load favours tall rank grassland uh, and not wildflowers is what we're after. So two cuts a year and it's the same, uh, I mean, Plant Life do an excellent guide, which I, which I uh, show at the end, um, which uh, basically, um, indicates that and it's, it, it's in that guide in terms of how to manage your, your road verge um, but uh, yeah essentially two cuts uh, and mo uh, remove the arisings uh, every time um, in order to get the best uh, pluralistic interest on your road verge so as I said this is this is not what we're after uh, that's sort of what we're after I mean <laughs> that's that there is clearly a uh, planted verge. Uh, so that's a seeded verge. Um, these are corn annuals. So uh, if anyone lives in Exeter, you might see the wild city uh, signs dotted about. So, so that's a Devon Wildlife Trust initiative where they seed um, roundabouts and, and uh, some road verges throughout the city. Um, they do it with this sort of uh, seed mix, which is, which is, like I said, an annual seed mix. So uh, what that means is they have to spend quite a lot of money every year scraping back the topsoil and reseeding. So this is an option in some locations, in, in urban areas especially. Um, but in rural areas, uh, probably not the best way to go down. Um, it's probably best to undertake regular management and see what seed banks are already in the, uh, in the road verge and just need some sympathetic management, really. Um, so... Uh, with all that in mind, we are in a position in Devon where um, a number of verges, the uh, visibility displays are cut regularly and are managed regularly. Um, and uh, what we are also in a situation is, is where there's actually quite a lot of road verges throughout the county which have no management at all and are um, being overgrown, lost to scrub, um, lost to rank grassland and that sort of stuff so um as devon county council we've sort of set up an initiative which follows on from a uh hlf funded project that was being run in the biosphere in north devon which was uh called life on the verge and the idea of that was to allow local communities to manage road verges for the benefit of wildlife basically uh, and that was piloted in the north devon biosphere area um and sort of been rolled out countywide um 
to try and uh, encourage communities to to um, to to manage road verges, basically. Um, and there's a step by step guide on our website. Um, and uh, basically, I've, I'll just go through the steps on that in terms of how to go about setting up a community group and managing road verges uh, for the benefit of wildlife. So uh, the first step is to contact the DCC Neighbourhood Highways Officer. Um, now, I'm not sure if, if uh, you're aware, but every uh, electoral district in Devon has its own Neighbourhood Highways Officer. And there's a list online, so you just have to Google uh, Devon uh, County uh, Neighbourhood Highways Officers and whatever electoral division you're in will have its own um, highways officer. And basically what they're supposed to do, or what they are, is a conduit between um, your local parish issues and the DCC Highways team. So they are the responsible for organising the cyclical work, so clearing of ditches and drainage features. And they are also in charge of um, cutting or uh, organising the cutting of road verges and in some instances, in some very limited instances, the cutting back of hedge, hedges where they uh, abut the highway and become a safety issue. Uh, so the first step is to contact your neighbourhood highways officer. If you have a road verge in mind um, and you want to manage it for, for the benefit of wildlife, the first thing to do is to, to check with them that your verge isn't already managed as a visibility or health and safety uh, uh, display basically and uh, because if it is and if it isn't safe they'll the, the highways officer will tell you straight away and you have to find an alternative um, an alternative verge um, so once you've checked with that and the, the verge is safe to, to be managed um, then the next step on is to undertake a health and safety course um, or health and safety training to be covered by Devon County Council's third party public liability insurance. Um, now, uh, in order to be covered on that, so that will that will basically cover you for third party damage, um, you need to have undertaken the highway safety awareness e-learning course or become a road warden. Uh, they're the two options. Um, and uh, if you haven't done this course and you were to work on the verge and you didn't have the safety course and then you were to cause damage to somebody else's vehicle or property or anything like that, then you wouldn't be covered uh, by Devon County Council's insurance. Um, the reason you would be under this if you've done this course is because you'd be acting as a volunteer on behalf of DCC. Um, it, I must stress it doesn't cover uh, personal insurance. so. We, we, even if you have done this, you're not covered for personal insurance or person, personal injury, uh, but you are covered uh, for third party public liability. Uh, so it's really key. Uh, the best way to, to con is to contact that email address there and um, say that you're interested in undertaking the course, basically. And it, like I said, it's free. There's only a limited number of courses that DCC can give to each community because uh, we have to pay for a license internally but the, the course is free for volunteers to undertake so there's no there's no cost on your part but it does restrict the number of people that can have the that can undertake the course in each um in each uh community group or, or parish uh or you can become a uh road warden uh, and under that again which i believe is free um you get to chapter eight trained uh, and um, that it doesn't just restrict you to grass cutting. So road wardens fix potholes and clear ditches, but they're basically, you are a, a volunteer highways officer that works within your parish. But as part of the road warden scheme is obviously you are able to be chapter eight trained and fully trained to work next to a highway. So you can cut grass if, if you want to and manage certain um, verges so it's really important it's really good to check to see you haven't already got an existing road warden because they may be able to do some of the work uh some biodiversity work for you uh or if you if you're interested in having one all the it's all on that link there which will be which will be available um uh, in this in this presentation sent out afterwards so that link at the bottom there just has all the information on there about uh becoming a road warden 
So uh, once you have de determined that your verge is safe to work on, um, and, and basically what that means is, and in, in the health and safety course will, will highlight this, but essentially, you know, depending on the speed of the road, there's certain distances that you have to work from the edge of the highway in order to be deemed safe. So for example, if it's a 60 mile an hour road, which is unlikely, but if it was, you, you wouldn't be able to work within two and a half meters of the edge of the carriageway. So it's only really wide verges that are applicable in that area. Um, but if it's a 20 mile an hour or 30 mile an hour road, then, then you can, the, the clearance is, is reduced. Um, and if there's a footpath between the road and the verge, then they're obviously the best because they're completely safe to work on. Um, that will all be highlighted in the in the in the highway safety course. Um, uh, so once you've done those first two steps, the third step is to assess the existing value of your verge, and that's really important from a biodiversity point of view, obviously, um, because that will sort of tell you what management is best um, uh, for whatever flowers you have already. Now. Um, again there's a handy uh, there's a handy guide at the end of this presentation which which will, from plant life which will help which will help with that but um it, it as it says there what's already growing on your virgin how can this be enhanced it's really important that the first thought is always to manage sensitively rather than clear the verge and chuck a seed packet down or something um because a lot of seed packets although they may have been grown and sourced in Britain they're very homogenous and if you if every verge was covered in them we would really lose um, sort of local distinctiveness of our road verges and, and wildflowers so it's really important I mean some some Devon road verges for example have uh, the only place in Britain that there's, there's a virgin but fastly has Deptford pinks it's the largest population of Deptford pinks in the whole of Britain it's really important that we manage for them rather than start again and chuck a seed packet down so it's always assess the value of your verge if you can and manage uh sen sensitively to try and enhance what seeds and what wildflowers may already be in there if it doesn't work then there's remedial actions that you can take such as throwing down yellow rattle or then scarifying and chucking down wildflower seed and all that sort of stuff but the first point should always be trying to enhance the existing verge um and step four is management so as i kept mentioning there's the link to the plant life document there it's called the good verge guide um i'm not going to repeat what i've said I've, there's the there's the management there um it's a really really good book or guide it's a it's a pdf online and it just it's a step-by-step -step on how to manage verges uh, i've already sort of covered it um cut twice a year in february and then again in august when flowers have set seed remove the arisings and grass cuttings from the verge and as i said before don't be tempted to reseed better to cut regularly and see what's there uh, rather than chucking down a, a seed packet because and again a lot of soils in devon are quite distinctive so you may find that buying a seeds and chucking it down is can be a, a bit of a waste of money in the short term so it's really important just to manage sensitively first and uh, and then and then go from there um, right, so that's me. I went slightly over, so I will stop sharing and I'll pass on to Jan. And uh, I've noted there's a there's a number of questions in the chat, so um, we'll come back to them after Jan's talk. And uh, apologies if I don't get to answer all of them today, but uh, I'll try my best. And um, yeah, I'll just stop sharing and pass over to Jan now. Have done all right, Jen. Sorry, I'll try again. I, I, something else came up and not what I wanted. Here we are. Let's try this again. Any good? Excellent. There we go. 
Brilliant. Thank um, you, Jen. Sorry about that. I don't know. Uh, this laptop has a bit of a mind of its own, I'm afraid, but uh, hopefully it won't, won't do anything else dreadful. Right. OK, so I'm going to start the slideshow, um, which I can't actually see at the moment. Can I? The bar at the top's in the way. How can I get rid of that? Oh, I'll do it this way. I think I can do it this way. If you press function button five on the keyboard. Function and number five? F5 should be at the top of your keyboard. Okay. F oh F5. Okay, with with function as well. No, just F5. Okay. Just F5. Ah. Okay, good. Thank you. I couldn't see the uh the bar at the top. Can you all see that now? Hopefully you can. Right, so this is um, uh, Littleham Churchyard, a glorious site in Exmouth, and um, uh, just to show you some of the lovely places that we're going to be talking about. Uh, I'm going to come back to that one later, but um, it's just a lovely midsummer view. The Saxon there is very keen to manage it as a wildflower meadow, and we've had advice about managing it. And in fact, we had a very delightful haymaking day there as well. So I'll come back to that later. Right, so Exmouth Wildflower Wardens, um, which is what I'm going to talk about. Um, um, this is a, a, a subgroup of Exmouth Wildlife Group. Um, this delightful little plant um, in the picture, uh, with its absolutely delightful little name as well. Um, this plant just popped up on my allotment. Um, goodness knows where it came from. Um, and um, I, I love the plant because it's very, very pretty, but it's also, um, the name of it is fascinating because it seems to hark back to an earlier time. Um, it's thought that it's named weasel snout because of the shape of the seed pod, but you know, who in this day and age would actually know what a weasel snout looked like at all? You know, most people probably never even seen a weasel, never, never, uh, never mind its snout. So a lovely name for a lovely plant. And um, I was up there today and found a few seed pods, so I'm hoping it's going to come back this year. Right, so what is Exmouth Wildlife Group? Well, we, uh, a little group of us started this group in 2018, um, partly as a result of the neighbourhood plan, which seemed to be offering opportunities really to look after the wildlife in Exmouth um, on a more organised kind of basis. Um, there was talk of um, valley parks and protection for green corridors and so on, which is all very, very positive. Um, the other reason really was that um, it was becoming known, I think, uh, research was beginning to show that um, urban wildlife in some cases doing better than wildlife out in the countryside. Um, the Living with Mammals survey has um, shown several years running that hedgehogs in urban areas uh, are beginning to recover a tiny bit, um, whereas you know, they are very thin on the ground out in the countryside. Um, and you know, here we've got a hoverfly and I think it's a honeybee and they're all just in, well, I do get hedgehogs in my garden, that's not my photo, but I, I do love the wildlife that comes into my garden. And it seems to me, um, it has done for some time that um, the Devon Wildlife Trust, the Woodland Trust, all these wonderful organisations, they're a little bit inclined to concentrate on their own reserves. And it was almost as if the wildlife that lives in Exmouth needed a group to keep an eye, to look after it, to, to be its champion. Because we do have a lot of wildlife in Exmouth and, um, you know, it can just quietly disappear if nobody's keeping an eye on it. So that's why the group started. Uh, we have a Facebook group and a website. Um, which I'll come back to at the end. So why wardens for wildflowers? Well, <laughs> somebody pointed out to me that there was an argument raging on Facebook, apparently, at the time, um, about the grass cutting in Exmouth. Um, the usual story, why haven't the council cut the grass on X, Y and Z roads or in the park or whatever it was? And another group of people saying, why have the council come and cut all the wildflowers down? And it, there just seemed to be a huge divide between groups and people feel very strongly on both sides. So I thought, well, 
we don't really want short grass everywhere. I think that's pretty obvious because um, lots of our green spaces are um, wonderful opportunities for, for wild plants. Um, but on the other hand, we don't actually want long grass everywhere because I just put these little pictures here. Just, we, we need places, this is a town, and um, we need places for people to run around, children to kick a football, people run around with a kite, whatever it is. Somebody's been, you know, somebody to do their yoga on the grass. And I think um, seeing um, parents sitting outside school gates waiting for their children to come out, just sitting on the grass and chattering. Um, if you have long grass everywhere, that's, that really does spoil some of those opportunities. So you want short grass in some places and long grass in other places, or long grass, including um, meadow, of course, meadow flowers, uh, in other places. But you need to actually have um, a bit of a plan to work out which is which. Um, in Exmouth, it was even, even more complicated because we have three councils here um, and um, the, the, the matter of the council is very complicated because people don't always know which council they're talking about um, and who's actually supposed to be doing what and who hasn't been doing what they want them to do. And this, I mean, this goes back for years, doesn't it? In the letters to the paper, you know, oh, the council haven't cut the verge again. Um, and it, it seemed to me that what we needed was some data. We needed some evidence. We needed some information. Um, oh, I forgot to mention the little mining bee there. Um, mining bees tend to prefer short grass too. So it's, uh, you know, short grass is good for wildlife as well. Um, so, so we needed to collect some data. We needed to actually find out what was growing where and which places, whether there were any places that were really special enough um, to, to, to have a special plan, a management plan, or just generally um, to try and gather evidence about what was, what, which would be the best places to, to, um, to leave uncut. So um, we thought, let's try and find some volunteers and put it on Facebook saying, um, would anybody like to join a, a team of volunteers? Um, this is what we're going to do, um, you know, contact us if you're interested. And we made a team of 12 people, um, and um, which was great, including myself and, and Heath Nichols, who's not here at the moment, but was very, has been very much part of organizing this right from the start. Um, and we were initially mainly interested in plant biodiversity, so we were looking for places where there were lots of different species growing, um, not, not just all nettles or all um, hogweed or whatever it was. Um, and we weren't particularly looking for rare plants, we were looking more for the places where you go and you just think, oh, what's that growing there? And oh, look, there's something else over here. And just that biodiversity. Uh, of plants, which of course then supports biodiversity of invertebrates and the whole food chain. So that was what we, that was the idea that came, came to us. So um, we, we talked to East Devon about it, first of all, and um, we had at that time um, a programme called Wild Exmouth running here, which was funded by East Devon Council, District Council. And um, the Wild Exmouth um, group were very um, were keen to support what we were doing. They thought it was a good idea. And we, we got a very generous grant from them, um, which um, provided the books for everybody, high vis vests, hand lenses, and clipboards, and so on. Um, Devon County Council provided training for us. And there is um, Mike there, Mike and Mike Waller in the middle. A botanist who came uh, and we had a day in Fear Park which was very delightful it was a bit chilly but it was a lovely day and um, and we talked a lot about flowers in the morning and spent the afternoon um, walking up the old railway path just looking to see if we could how many things we could identify really um, and it was very delightful the book that we gave to everybody was Harrop's Wild Flowers um, because it seemed to be um, not too technical to start with and um, easy to find what you're looking for. Um, just to point out that our programme wasn't just about verges, it was also about green spaces, um, playing, you know, so-called playing fields, um, open spaces, just little 
there are a lot of places in Exmouth um, that are grassy, basically. Um, and um, so we, we, we wanted to include those, not just the verges. Now, I am not a botanist, no, far from it, actually. So the training was very welcome. Uh, my mother brought me up, uh, all of us four children, to, to know the names of all the plants where we, where we lived. And I can remember most of those, but uh, I'm not a botanist. And I was having to start from scratch with a lot of the West Country plants that grow in Exmouth. So if I've misidentified anything, please don't shout at me, just, just explain. Right, so uh, having had our training day, um, volunteers chose an area that they wanted to survey. Um, there are an awful lot of green spaces in Exmouth. Some of them are quite small, just on the corners of roads or outside the shops or whatever it is. Some of them are really quite large playing fields. Um, I put together a recording sheet. Um, I'll talk more about that later because it was actually, it wasn't really quite right. It wasn't, um, we had, we need to modify it and I think, uh, think again about what information we want people to record. The plan was to use iRecord um, to set up a, a, a sort of group account in iRecord. And Heath and I did try this at several, you know, we spent some time trying to sort it out. We just couldn't get it to work and gave up. Not, we haven't given up forever, but we just felt at that point in time, actually, um, we ought to be getting on with our surveys and concentrating on learning to identify plants. Um, we did come across PlantNet. I don't know if any of you know that, uh, know PlantNet. It's an app. Um, and I understand from chat on Twitter and elsewhere that among botanists, it's thought to be probably better than most of the apps. But it's not completely reliable and it does occasionally give you something completely crazy. But if you're stuck, it's, it's quite useful. Um, I spent ages at Hawks <laughs> Nature Reserve trying to identify something and I was on the wrong track and in the end I just showed it to PlantNet and it, it, it put me straight and um, you know so you can you can save yourself a lot of time basically but don't rely on it that's all I'm saying. Another useful book is this The Wildflower Key by Rose it's quite technical but um, moving on from from the Harrop's Wildflowers it's, it's a good next step. I put a question mark there because um, those of you watching and listening may have your own ideas that, and you may want to share um, what you know about other books that you found really useful. So we can talk about that in the questions if anybody wants to. Um, we set up a, wet, a WhatsApp group um, just to sort of chat between ourselves. Um, quite a lot of sharing of pictures, quite a lot of saying, oh, look what I found, you know, and, and that sort of thing. It was, it was really nice. Um, it, Sort of fizzled out towards the end of the summer because um, uh, we, we stopped doing our surveys. But it, uh, while the surveys were going on, it was really quite useful. Um, and as I say, we moved on slightly from just focusing purely on biodiversity, but because we were beginning to find some, some well, I, I say rare there, but you know, unusual plants, and we felt actually that they were going to be important in any decisions that were made. Uh, and I said at the bottom there, Exmouth has a lot of green spaces and verges. It certainly has. It's a delightful town, Exmouth. And um, I think most of us absolutely love living here because there are so many green, <coughs> little green corners and nice trees and places to visit. So I'm going, I'm going to be a bit self-indulgent now and talk about the area that I surveyed, just as an example of, of the sort of thing we were doing. Um, this is St John's Field in Exmouth. You can see St John's Road um, looping around the top of it there. You can see some cars parked. There are housing estates all round, but they're fairly well spaced out. There's a new housing estate being built at the bottom. It's actually almost finished now. There's a little tiny nature reserve in the corner, Hillcrest Community Nature Reserve, and there's a stream, Withercombe Brook, which runs down the bottom. So this is a place that's that's um, got quite a few habitats um, within quite close range. Um, there's a lower field, the one on the left, um, facing sort of south um, west. Uh, I say facing, but you know what I mean. Um, now that has been retained as, as a playing field. It's cut short um, and families use it a lot. Lots of children kick a football around on it or ride their bikes on it. And it's um, 
it's been kept as short, short grass, which is fine. Um, there's a top field, which is one of the ones I surveyed, and there's a bank in between. You can possibly see a sort of hedge across the middle there. Um, that is actually quite a steep bank between the two fields. Um, and I did a separate survey for the bank uh, from the survey that I did for the top field. So I visited this field um, several times during um, midsummer, really. Um, and really enjoyed it. I, I think, um, you know, I, I can't emphasize too much really what, what an enjoyable um, project this has been for me. Um, I've learned such a lot about plants and I've met some lovely people and, and just doing the visits and, you know, just being a citizen scientist has just been really good fun and very rewarding. So, you know, we, that is part of the equation, isn't it? It is the enjoyment we get from nature. Uh, and towards the end of the summer, I was also looking for all sorts of other things that were living in the in both those areas, the lower, uh, sorry, the top field and the bank. So the top field, you can see on the left what it looked like. I think this was probably late, uh, early, well, July, I think, probably. I, I haven't got the date, I'm afraid. Um, lovely mixture of things, um, lots of oxide daisies and um, um, Knapweed and all, all sorts of other things which I wasn't really familiar with. Cats here, and um, I think it's called corky fruited water dropwort. Is that right? Uh, I've, I've forgotten the name of it now, but it's it was surprising how much of that there was. It was absolutely all over the all over the field. Towards the end of the season, um, the flea bane appeared, which was lovely. I love feed flea bane um, because the um, the hoverflies and the bees love it. Uh, and you can see here a hoverfly and um, uh, and, and a, a moth caterpillar, cinnabar moth, I think, caterpillar, and um, two blue butterflies enjoying the sunshine. So it was just delightful. And every time I went, I found new things. And by the end, I was I was um, seeing a, there were a lot of butterflies, mostly meadow browns, lots of bees. One species that I, I think is is fairly unusual, which I did record. Um, moths I'm hopeless on, so I'm afraid I couldn't record those, but lots of small moths. Grasshoppers absolutely everywhere. Um, hoverflies towards the end of the summer, beetles, spiders, the grass was full of spiders, and a few ladybirds as well. So it was just joyful, it really was. And here's the bank, which again was just beautiful during the summer. Um, quite a steep bank. I don't think that it's had much management in the past. So that might be an issue in the, in the long term. We might need to keep an eye on brambles and so on growing in there. But it was really beautiful, um, quite dense. And, and you can see lots of knapweed and, and oxide daisies. There's hedge bed straw there and um, wild carrot, all sorts of nice things. And little nooks and crannies with other things growing, self heal. And I think this is um, um, perforated St. John's work growing there and grass fetchling just in the, another little sunny corner. So it was quite lovely. So um, by the end of the summer, we've got quite a few surveys done. You can see on this map of Exmouth, the areas that were surveyed and the number of species that were found in each area, um, which was quite variable. Um, the one in, right in the middle that says 33 and 21, those are the two surveys that I've just been talking about. 33 species on that little bank. And I'm sure there are more than that there. As I said before, I'm not a botanist. I'm sure anybody who really knew what they were doing would find a lot more. So here's one of our, just an example of one of our record sheets. This one was done by Heath of Pound Lane Bank outside the allotments. Um, and so we recorded the species and um, the date, it was a period of time, in fact, in this case, but um, because he'd been looking at it for some time. And I put on the, 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 a, a column for the location, which I think really you just need a location for the site. You don't need a, a location for every single plant, obviously, that would be ridiculous. He put in a column for number because I think we began to feel that was quite important. Are there a lot of, is there a lot of this plant or is it, have you just found one? Um, and I, he and I both started to record um, butterflies and other things that we saw as well. He's put in bold two plants there that he thought were of particular interest. Neither of them were particularly 
um, common. Well, actually, one of them was quite abundant, he says. So, um, so I think that number column, um, which he introduced, was a very good idea. And I think we might, might be looking at that this year for our surveys. If you want to see the lists of, of plants that we found, you can go to our website. Um, all, all the plant lists are there. Um, apart from two, which I'll talk about. I just haven't got around to doing those yet, but the, the rest of them are all on our website. If you go to the uh, Wildflower Wardens page, you should be able to find them. Um, I'm now going to talk about one particular verge, which is of particular interest. Um, local naturalist Roger Hamlin and his wife Liz, they've been um, pointing out for some time, I think, along with some other people, but um, particularly Roger, who's incredibly knowledgeable about local wildlife, um, uh, that there was an extraordinary collection of plants in one small area on the verge, right next to, well, two very busy roads by some traffic lights. Um, and Roger put together this really beautiful um, leaflet or poster for Exmouth in Bloom, which I think was part of their proposal for the um, the in bloom competition. Um, I could be wrong, so please correct me if that's not, not right. One of the plants there, you can see on the right hand one of his posters, um, the flower of Bithynian vetch, which was growing quite happily on this bank. So this is, it, it's an unusual plant, I believe. Um, some people will know a lot more about it than I do. Um, but, um, Oh, interestingly, once we started looking for this plant, we did find it in quite a few places in Exmouth. So I think this may be a little bit of a hot spot. I found a great big clump of it up on the coastal path, um, which may well have crashed down with, with the, um, the cliff fall we had a few weeks ago. Um, but if so, it will be down there somewhere um, in the undercliff. So it's, it's not quite as rare here as it's generally thought to be nationally. In addition to that, other people were saying to me, have you seen the orchids? Um, a friend called Helen told me a couple of years ago, um, you know, there are orchids growing right next to the road. You know, it's just amazing. And so um, I think people were beginning to pay attention to it. So um, you can see Roger's, you probably can't read it all, but there's Roger's list of plants that he recorded there. Um, bee orchids uh, are um, obviously very beautiful. Uh, particularly no sorry I'll go back to that um, growing on a grassy bank actually in two areas um, one among the longer grass and one on some mown grass and Heath has spoken to the the people who manage the little industrial area there and he's put sticks in and they're very carefully cutting round these now in the bank um, they want to keep the bank cut short but they they're very careful to avoid the the vehicles well they have been so far anyway um, uh, and the bank looked like this during the summer. This is one of um, Steve Elcote's photographs. Thank you for letting us use your pic pictures. Um, lots of daisies, lots of all sorts of lovely things. And then amongst them, that there were these, uh, there was this Bithynian vetch growing. Um, grass vetchlings, um, and as I say, two species of orchid. Um, and around the same time that all this was going on, um, Mike was talking about, uh, Mike Waller, who's the, uh, um, Tom's colleague at, at Devon County Council, um, was talking about building a, a, a scoring system for special verges um, to be used throughout Devon, not, not just um, for us. Um, and he sent us a list of axiophytes um, and the Devon shortlist and Devon longlist. I'll briefly explain what I understand those to be. Um, axiophytes, as I understand it, are plants that have a particular, uh, that tell you something about a habitat, that it's particularly rich in plants. So they, if you have a lot of them, it's suggesting that you have a valuable site, if you like. And I think that's a very simple explanation, but that's the way I came at it. And he proposed giving those a score of two, for example. So for every axiophyte, you give a score of two. Uh, the Devon long list is quite a long list of, of um, all sorts of wildlife, not just um, um, plants, it's, you know, reptiles, absolutely everything um, that are of particular interest in Devon. 
And the shortlist is, uh, I think it's about, well, I, I can't remember now, is it 12 or 15? It's quite a short, short list of very important species that are particular for Devon. Um, so we started looking at this and actually because we're looking at green spaces as well as verges, we decided to score it. Um, we're playing around with this really at the moment, possibly a score per unit area. Um, um, Mike has also suggested that a simpler system would just be to take the most important plant. Um, and if, it's very, if you find any rare plants, then that automatically becomes a special verge because it gets a score of five. But we're, we're working on our own system, I think. Um, it may or may not work. We need to discuss that with the other volunteers when we get started again this year. But we would end up with a score per, per, um, per square meter, as it were, or per 100 square meters, in exactly something like that. Um, so the Dean and Way Verge now has its own management plan. It's obviously a special verge. Um, it's been designated as such um, by um, by all of us, but also by the town council and adopted as such. It has its own management plan. Um, and um, here are some of the volunteers which turned out to, to help with the management. Um, on the right um, is Tony, who is the leader of the town team who do the, the groundworks. Um, um, and he's been very, very enthusiastic about working with us, which has been really great. Um, and they, his team, he and his team, um, cut the grass quite short um, during, I think it was early March in the end, um, but we needed to remove all the cuttings. And so a lovely team of volunteers turned out and uh, we cleared it all in a couple of hours, actually, because many hands make light work, as you say. But actually, another question about Dean and Way is, um, what's the history of this place? I mean, where, why is it so special? Why, why does it have so many plants all in such a small area? And I do think that, you know, that's something that might be worth investigating. The Dean and Way was built quite a long time ago. It's a modern road, but it was built, you know, 30 years ago or something. Um, and it would be very interesting to know whether some of the earth the soil was brought in from somewhere else or was it just piled up from where it was or how was how did it end up where it is um because we now really need to look at the rest of dean and way um the verges all the way along it and find out what else is there you know in other places i think probably nothing quite as spectacular as that little area but but nevertheless um uh, i know steve um surveyed a, an area of dean and way verge uh, quite some distance from there and uh, again it was it was it was good diversity there so um i think we're hoping to um survey lots of dean and way this year so here's the uh, some of the team again that's tony on the left and some of the volunteers um raking very carefully and quite thoroughly all the cuttings there's a, a quite a large area of lichen growing there as well which we we were asked to keep away from and um, so that's been been left untouched obviously raking it would have damaged it uh, more photographs of the sort of beavering away a very successful morning we left it looking very tidy so at the end of 2021 um, we had uh, going back to, the, to our volunteer team again at the end of 2021 we had a meeting with all three councils um, Exmouth Town Council, street scene attended from East Devon. Um, Tom Wood is the was is their um, uh, leader and um, he came along to the meeting and Mike Waller came to, representing Devon County Council and as the botanist to advise us all. We sensed that there had been some initial reservations about the, the data that we were collecting and the volunteers um, that perhaps um, the people who are actually managing the verges and the green spaces um, thought we might be in interfering and that was certainly not our intention. We were not there to advise, we were simply there to gather information. Um, actually we've got into a dialogue about management as time's gone on which has been really interesting, I've learned an awful lot about it. 
but that wasn't what we set out to do. We were there simply to say, look, you know, this bit of bank here or this bit of grass has got all these plants growing in it. And, um, you know, it's a bit more special than that bit up the road that's just got, you know, I don't know, dandelions or, well, I like dandelions and bees like dandelions. You know what I mean? There might be other areas where there wasn't actually much growing at all. So um, there were some, I think, slight reservations, but I think those were overcome very positively at that meeting. Um, there are very complicated arrangements in Exmouth about who cuts what. The town council team cut some of the areas for Devon County Council, as um, Tom was explaining earlier. Um, and street scene, I think, um, cut a lot of the East Devon green spaces as well. So we've been... Um, sharing all the evidence, all the data that we've collected with, with everybody um, so that it can be used. It was a very positive meeting. So just moving away from the green spaces and the verges, having set up this team, um, we were then asked to do a, a fairly quick survey at Liverton Cops. Um, lots of ash trees have been removed from there. This is Woodland Trust, creating more light and space in the hope that more plants would uh, would be seen and 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 grow. Um, so we we spent two mornings listing the, what we could see there. I'm sure we didn't get all of them. Uh, it was there were two wet mornings and the weather really wasn't um, conducive to staying out for hours at a time. But um, here's a delightful little plant that Steve found and took a photograph of. So I think um, you know we can provide a, a kind of um, a baseline there, which um, could be very useful actually. You know, if, if removing those trees has opened up the woodland a little bit, let more light down to the woodland floor. And this, going back again to um, the churchyard at Littleham, um, Sean, who looks after the churchyard, um, he can't possibly keep all this cut short, and he doesn't want to. But of course, um, by the nature of things, people have complained. So we did a big survey there and actually found an enormous number of plants. And um, uh, Hannah um, Gibbons, our local botanist came, a local botanist, sorry, not a local botanist, a local botanist came and joined us for the, for the survey and uh, helped us uh, enormously identifying um, a lot of the plants that we were perhaps getting a little muddled over, or I was anyway. Um, so we ended up with a lovely list. The grass was later cut and we had a haymaking morning there later on to remove all the cuttings. Um, and it, there was a, a plan to take some of the cuttings and, and um, use them as um, green hay to seed the natural burial area. But I think in the end, we didn't, there wasn't time or manpower to do that this year, but maybe next year. And Sean said to me uh, several times, it was just great for him to have people coming in and taking an interest in what was happening there and what he was doing. Um, uh, because people did complain that it looked untidy, but he could say, well, there is, you know, we're doing this for a particular reason. Um, and, um, you know, this is the list of, of, of plants that have been found and, um, you know, various groups taking an interest in it. And, as with all the surveys that we did, I'm quite sure we didn't find everything. So who knows what else is there? So the plan for 2022, um, we're going to, we have a meeting planned for early April um, at Fair Park, um, hoping that all the volunteers can come. We've got three new volunteers at the moment. There may well be more in the pipeline, hopefully so. Not sure what we're going to do about training them, but we will definitely sort something out to help get them started. Um, and when I first thought about this, we were, Heath and I were talking about funding, but um, I think it looks as if East Devon might, might be willing to fund, fund us again um, for books and equipment for the new volunteers. Um, street scene this year, last, last year, everybody just chose a site that they liked. I chose St John's Field because it's just around the corner from me and, and um, seemed to me to be a very interesting site. People just chose one that they liked went off and did it but we did feel and actually two of the volunteers said it would have been best to have had a list of places where surveys were needed and they could have 
just adopted one then and gone off straight away and done it. And I think that's what we're probably going to do. So Street Scene are going to provide us with a list. Um, and volunteers will be able to choose one or as many as they like um, from the list. And that will, the data will all be shared, obviously, with the town council and with um, East Devon. So I'd just like to say thank you to East Devon uh, District Council for the generous grant that we had. Uh, we were so pleased to get it because it just made the whole thing possible. Uh, a big thank you to Devon County Council for providing free training for us and support all the way through from Mike Waller, who's been very supportive and helpful and patient, <laughs> um, answering um, questions. And um, Exmouth Town Council um, for accepting our contribution and putting it to good use in setting up our, our first special verge. We think there are probably going to be more, but we thought, I think we, everybody thought one was enough for this year. One special verge um, designated um, and um, adopted by the town council. And I'd also like to say a huge thank you to all the wildflower wardens. You, you just did such a great job and did it with such uh, such a positive attitude. And um, I hope you all enjoyed it as much as I did. That's really because it was very positive for me. And a big thank you to Heath, who isn't here, but um, was um, did at least as much, uh, at least half of, well, more than me probably, of the, of the practical stuff of getting this all up and running. So that's our website and our email address. If anybody wants to contact me to talk about the scoring or anything else. So I think that's that's about it, really. Brilliant. Thank you, Jan. Um, that's great. Um, really good. Shall Thank I you stop? Very... Yeah, I if you wouldn't, if you wouldn't mind, that'd be brilliant. Okay, um, it's gone. Oh, excellent. Uh, great. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, we have slightly gone over, but we can. Oh, oh sorry. Was that my no, fault? No, it was my fault. I, I went to. I was. I was rambling on too much at the start. <laughs> Um, but uh, we can have 10-15 minutes to questions if, if there is any. Uh, I've noted there's a lot in the chat which I'll get to um, in order so if you do have any queries please pop them in the chat uh, and I'll answer as many as I can um, including any questions for Jan. Um, so uh, I'll start at the top and uh, work my way down like I said if you do have any questions put them in there I'll try and answer all of them if I can't uh, for whatever reason then I'll the the if you put them in the chat function it's all saved as part of the zoom call so then we can answer them separately um so i will start at the top uh why are urban roads cut more frequently than rural roads uh so dcc policy is um it's purely based on safety risk so urban roads are obviously used more frequently um and um it is simple uh, i know the speeds differ but the, uh, the the safety risk is deemed to be higher for urban roads and so they are cut more times a year um could you vary the cutting time slightly but maintain the four times etc do devon county council specify the maximum height of grass before it has to be cut so uh there is as part of the policy there is a maximum height of grass uh for rural cutting it's 100 millimeters for urban cutting it is 40 millimeters um that's not to say that obviously DCC are out there and as soon as it gets to 41 millimetres, the grass is cut. Uh, the way that it is done is it is done for a for the rural cutting. Um, it is done purely on a on a uh, importance basis. So um, um, which is something that DCC highways are looking into. So, for example, they're not grouped geographically in terms of when they're cut. So they are cut in terms of uh, how important they are and how uh, important it is that the safety issues are, are are sorted out so that's why the a roads are cut at the start of the year and then again well start of the, the grass cutting year i suppose and then again later on um it is unlikely that dcc would vary the cutting um purely based on the fact that any any move away from the cutting at the moment is deemed to be a safety risk so they're unwilling to make that change although that that being said more recently there has been some positive conversations with our highways team about um you know the potential for 
reducing the number of cuts um you know there's a lot of evidence out there that that cutting and removing arisings for example as i said earlier reduces the um nutrient load in soils and reduces the grass growth uh so i think some a study from plant life suggested that you could uh if you do that regularly you can take take out if you cut seven times you can remove one cut and only cut six because the grass growth is reduced so there's a lot of evidence out there they are open to working with us but currently because as i said they only cut for safety uh any change to the current policy would need some rigorous uh tom this was this was more if you if you took it over for yourselves you see that was oh the thing. yes yeah 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 so if, if you took a, say, yeah, I couldn't yeah. Type no sorry Bill. no so um so as i said uh it becomes a bit tricky if you were to take a verge over that is cut by devon county council uh you will have to enter into a legal agreement and that legal agreement will will stipulate as and when uh that has to be cut and it has to be cut a minimum of four times so um but i don't think there's anything to suggest that they can't be altered slightly uh in terms of when those cuts are undertaken um in terms of cutting four times even on some verges delaying cutting with that amount of cutting throughout the year it probably has minimal impact on biodiversity anyway but um that will all be as part of the legal agreement so you'd have to ask the highways team and again i'm sure I, I would imagine that if you were to do that then liability for if there was any accident may shift onto the district council so i think that's why or, or the count, parish council or whoever takes it on so i think that's why it's normally stuck with uh with uh with the, with the current dcc policy but there could be some scope for that um the next question is uh how is visibility assessed uh, is it possible to suggest a narrow band of cutting, e.g. one metre wide? Yes. So visibility is um, is assessed, as I said before, loosely. It's basically junctions, forward approaches to signage and um, laybys. Uh, any sort of bends in roads, that has obviously got a visibility issue. Um, if you're coming up a hill and, and around a corner. So it is, it's done basically on in terms of... Um, in terms of in terms of that it is quite subjective i suppose from a highways perspective and they have taken a, a obviously a, a safety first approach so sometimes you may look at it and go well that's not a visibility issue but it you know it's based off accident data and all that sort of stuff as well um is it possible to suggest a narrow band of cutting e.g one meter wide yes so dorset county council used to do that um and some lpas cut just a meter um that tends to be um again challenged from a safety perspective uh in that they are reluctant current policy for devon county is to cut the full width of the verge again as a safety policy uh what that does mean is we have also trialed that on some verges uh throughout the county where they've cut a reduced width unfortunately what that means is then the remaining bit of the verge doesn't get cut at all so we have actually found in some areas where the visibility display is cut full width twice a year although they're cut in slightly the wrong time of year so mid-may and mid-june actually that has been more beneficial in some instances than just cutting a one meter strip because the they're actually cut uh, whereas before they're they're not uh, it is a bit of a balance i do understand that because obviously cutting is quite visual and quite instant whereas overgrown with grass and scrub takes a bit of time so is, is less visual but um that is an option and that has been discussed is in important verges where there has been potentially an option to reduce the vis uh, or the, the visibility cut uh, that has been discussed with the highways highways colleagues so they are open to that uh, it would need some justification from a safety point of view but they are they are open to that um uh, again yeah unnecessary cutting as i said dcc is only health and safety so we do the bare minimum at the moment which isn't which isn't uh which isn't to say that it's obviously brilliant for biodiversity um but we're in a situation in devon where devon county doesn't overcut as many of its verges it's, it's more about undercutting really um uh, do, 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 do. Uh, how do we identify the verges that are not managed by anyone? Are they on the Devon Environment Viewer map? So they're not, unfortunately. 
Um, so in order to identify the verges which are managed um, by DCC highways, it's best to contact your neighbourhood's highways officer because they should have a map on there which shows which are visibility displays, which are managed by who, who owns what. They should have all that information for you. If you, you say you're from a local uh, community group and you're interested, then they should be able to share that for you. So the neighbourhood highways officer is probably the best one to, to go to for, for that one. Um, I must admit, Dave, I'm not entirely sure what a PLI means with regards to wildlife wardens and team bridge. So maybe if you just add that in the chat, I can I can come back to that question, whether that would be recognised by Devon County Council. Um, could one member of a group have be be trained as a road warden and lead other volunteers? Uh, yes, I believe that is true. If you are a road warden, you are able to take other volunteers in your group. Um, you would have to check that. I'm not 100% sure whether that is correct, but you'd have to check that when you're um, when you're undertaking the road warden scheme, whether that is the case, whether others are, are covered under the, the insurance or whether it is just the road warden. I have a feeling other people were also covered, but but that is worth checking with highways um, when, what, if you, when you sign up for that scheme. Uh, do, 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 do. What is the county view on ragwort? Uh, yes, um, as, as Dave Smallshire puts in the chat, uh, ragwort is, part of a weeds act from 1959 um i'm not entirely sure there's been anything ever prosecuted under the weeds act but i could be wrong um they we don't we don't dcc do anything with ragwort uh, at this current time um we, we we don't have a policy our current policy for uh weeds and also invasive species is, is we don't manage them uh, on road verges we we make a note of the location of invasives, uh, such as Japanese knotweed and Himalayan balsam, when they're told to us, but we, we don't have a policy for, for management at the moment. Again, that is something that I work, uh, trying to work quite hard with our highways colleagues to uh, to understand if there is anything that can be done, but um, at the moment, there is no policy of, of uh, invasive species management. Um, and, and obviously that extends to ragwort. The, the, there isn't, um, there's quite a lot of ragwort in Devon as well. So I, think, I don't think they've got the budget to deal with ragwort, unfortunately. Um, but yeah, other invasives aren't dealt with either. Um, uh, do, 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 do. And, and there's a lot of good, um, uh, good. Um, a lot of people saying uh, just with a with a few comments on on yellow rattle. If there's any other questions, apologies again that we've overrun. If there's any other questions, please pop them in the chat or email uh, Mike um, or myself. If you have if my email address is just tom whitlock at devon .gov .uk. Um So please just just um, uh, ask any questions that way. Um, uh, and um, yeah, if there isn't anything else, I think that that's done for the evening. Like I said, any other queries, just just put it in the chat and we will answer them. Uh, the recording will be put up on YouTube uh, if anyone missed anything or came in late um, or had poor internet connection. Uh, apologies, I think my internet connection went at some point, so hopefully the, it will be uh, okay on the recording. But uh, if there's nothing else, uh, that will do for this evening. Thank you very much. Have a good rest of your evening. Thank you, Tom and John. Thank you.